Yeah. Oops. Should have put a hat on or something. Oh. It's up to you. Were you wearing a hat in the last time? Yeah. Okay, and welcome back to an episode of Between Two Peacocks. So, <clears throat> to start with, uh, it seems like everybody really enjoyed our last video, which is encouraging for us. Yay! We're going to continue on this process as best as we can. And again, try and get through as many people's questions as is possible without making each video really, really long. To start with, we got a question from Charles Carlson on YouTube. It said, great show. Thank you. My dog loves to retrieve, unlike any other I've ever had, but absolutely refuses to hang on to whatever he's carrying once he is near me. So, retrieves to, as we often refer to this, retrieves to foot. The answer and the best way to work through this would be formal retrieving work. That's going to be taking your dog through the entire process, which involves teaching hold, collar conditioning to hold, teaching fetch, collar conditioning to fetch, and then putting that all together back on the ground. We do have an older video series on this on YouTube that you can go through. It's a fairly involved process, but you will be very happy with the results if you complete it with your dog. Thanks for the question. Our next question is from McMope. Again, if we butcher your hashtags, totally sorry. Recommended dog breed that is a family dog first and then a water Auckland dog. Well, a GSP, of course. I mean, they are the best dogs in the world. But to be honest and to be fair, um, short hairs make great family dogs, excellent upland dogs, as well as can be great waterfall dogs. But it definitely depends on the specific breedings. Um, there's some dogs that are gonna excel at that more than others, as well as being honest with yourself and saying, okay, this is the type of conditions I'm gonna be hunting in. It's going to be really cold. 90% uh, of the time that I'm out waterfall hunting, you might wanna look into a different breed. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself as well, how much upland hunting am I wanting to do? And am I wanting a dog that's going to be a pointing dog in the upland field? And that's really going to be um, where you have to figure out which your priority is. And yes, a short hair can be an all around versatile dog, but there are some dogs out there that would excel at waterfall versus maybe the short hairs, depending on what conditions you are hunting in. Get a short hair. Get a short hair. Okay, next question is from GSP underscore fly fishing. It says, what hunt slash bird training can be done if you don't have access to birds or areas for gunfire scenario? Um, so training the hunting dog without access to birds or gunfire. I'm gonna just have to say on this one, probably need to find access to birds and areas uh, that have availability of having gunfire. This question is from Facebook from Chet Coton. Their vet's recommending they free feed their GSP puppies. He says it keeps the dog from being food motivated and virtually eliminates the risk that the dog is obese later in life. What are our thoughts on free feeding versus using the food as a training motivator? Well, with our dogs and short hairs, we want our dogs to be food motivated because yes. that allows us to have something that has a value for them to want to work for, especially when we're starting training um, and clicker training, having the food reward um, mean something is important. So we want dogs to be food motivated. The other side of it is the free feed, your dog's not gonna be obese. It takes a dog with a special temperament and personality to not do that. Um, literally in all of the dogs we've owned over all of the years, I could list maybe one dog that would be able to have done that. Vino? Lucy. And Lucy. Yeah. Okay, two. Two. And the rest of them would, like grandpa, gorge themselves until they make themselves sick or fat. So get into a bag of food, eat 30 pounds of it. How? Where it goes? I, I don't know. Yes. So definitely we don't recommend free feed as well as there's some other things which is going to lead into a new video that we're going to have coming out soon on why it's important that dogs don't have the opportunity to pick at their food all day long where Basically, that free feed comes the, in. The importance of teaching your dog to eat which is kind of what the veterinarian is recommending the opposite of. Especially with hunting dogs, um, we need the dogs to eat when the food is offered 
so that they have the energy needed to train, to hunt hard throughout the day. And then when the food's offered again in the evening, they have that drive to eat what's given to them so that they can recover and refuel for the next day. If you're on a week long hunting trip and your dog's like, mm, I'll eat when I feel like it because it'll be there when I want it, your dog's gonna really suffer. Um, low energy and recovery are gonna go way down. So. It's one of the most common things that gets brought up when I'm talking with guys that are traveling with dogs is issues with eating, which is why we're going to make another video specifically talking about how we teach dogs to eat. Great question. This question is from Instagram, one Emron. Do y'all use shock or vibration on the e-call? Great question. We use both depending on the situation. We typically begin collar conditioning with vibrate um, and then we utilize stimulation later when we have higher distraction situations. Pretty much all of DT systems collars and only a few models that don't, but most of them have both stimulation and vibrate. And the really cool thing about DT's collars is that the vibrate is the separate button. We've actually seen some other units. Um, you have to dial back and forth yeah. to get to vibrate, and then you have to dial it to get to stimulation. And when you need to change between the two, it's... Not mentioning any pressure on it. <laughs> um, it's more <important. laughs> That you, you basically have to switch back and forth, and having the separate button of being able to utilize vibrate and utilize stimulation without having to roll a dial is important. Timing is important, and that makes your timing be able to work more accurately, more effectively. So, great question. KY Paris on Instagram, what brand nail clippers and file do you recommend? We have a brand on our Amazon that we really like. It's called Safari. It's also on our website under our recommended items. Um, it's a smaller nail clipper, so we feel like it gives more control. Uh, when trimming nails, it's pretty inexpensive. So when we trim as many dogs' nails as we do, when we need to replace it because it's getting dull, it's not a huge expense. I think it's about eight bucks. Cheap. And then we also use Dremel um, for a grinder for dremeling their nails and shaping. Good question. Okay, another question from Instagram. I'm gonna say it right now. Instagrammers, you guys are rocking this. We are trying to pull equally from platforms and pretty much the There's a huge, lot of Instagram interaction. portion coming from Instagram. So, um, Instagram question, er, 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 yeah. We'll put it on the screen. Do you ever use the e-collar for healing after you've trained with the Easy Lead? Absolutely. Now we actually haven't created a video of this. Um, we've kind of only done videos to start the introduction to our Easy Lead, kind of how that process looks. But yes, if you watch our introductory commercial, it talks about having a progressive training system through the Easy Lead. You have the halter style to start with, and then you have a and just a slip style, like your standard slip style leash. And then all the way back out to just a four and a half foot leash with the standard Easy Lead or a six foot leash with the Easy Lead XL. So to answer the question of when do we switch over the collar, once the dog is good at walking, no longer pulling, then we go to just a slip style leash and then start to overlay collar. This would be the transition between needing the muzzle to being able to transition to Collar conditioning. It's been a very common question. The theme this... has been maybe not exact wording, but it's been very common on all of our platforms on how to do this transition with the Easy Lead, and it's something that we definitely want to put out there um, in a on its own video. I think this week alone, like six or seven people ask it. So that says yes. a video is needed. We will be shooting a video soon. Uh, but yes, we do use e collar for healing. Great question. Next question from Facebook from Carrie Welling. Do you work with setters often? They've been looking for a trainer. They have dual purpose Irish setters and they're looking for somebody that can work with different breeds. Do we adjust our training when working with different breeds? Yes, so we breed short hairs and we train a lot of short hairs, but that's not the only breed we train. Uh, we've worked with some Gordon setters, we've worked with some English setters, we've worked with Brock Italianos, Brock Francais, English Cockers, Boykin Spaniels, Labrador Retrievers, the list goes on and on. German Wire Hair Pointers, DKs, DDs, Griffons, and all dogs have different personalities. Even within a breed, the dogs have different personalities. So 
even short hairs, you know, some of them are a little bit softer temperaments, calmer personalities, some are higher powered, more driven personalities. So it's not just, oh, this is our training style, this is what we do for every dog that walks through the door. We adjust that based on what each dog needs, make modifications, even within a breed, but definitely across breeds as well. To touch on that very quickly, um, a lot of people have asked us about a book. Why have you guys not written a book about your training philosophies? And it comes right into this, is that we don't believe in a cookie cutter style training program. That would be that we try and cram each individual dog into this is how we train dogs. And when you write a book, you end up being very limited to a, this is the path you should follow. And our philosophy is that each dog kind of goes along their own path, which is why we've done a training video series with different dogs um, so that we can show this dog did this and this dog did this and this dog needed this. And people have commented on, hey, so in this series, in this series, you did things in a different order. And yes, we did. And that's because those dogs needed those in that order. Usually we try and explain that, but ultimately, yes, we train to each individual dog's needs and where they need help and need everything else. Uh, I should have just stopped with, we train to each individual dog's needs. Mr. Wordy over here. What do you guys use for flea and tick control? Question is on Instagram by one man mosh pit. I like, I like it. it. We use Brevecto tablets. Brevecto is a three month treatment. And where we're at, we actually treat um, nine months out of the year being off December, January, and February, which is when it's cold, frozen, there's no fleas and ticks. So depending on where you're at in the country, that can change a little bit. The further south you are, the more likely you are to need that 12 months out of the year, the further north, you may be able to skip down to even six months out of the year. We like it because it's an edible chew. All of our dogs enjoy it as a, a treat. treat. Yeah. Um, it doesn't leave that oily spot on their back. With... Don't have to worry about bathing the same. Yep. Um, and it's three months, so it's easy to get on a schedule that we can remember, yep. quarterly, that sort of thing. Um, and all of our dogs have done really well on it. We've had really good flea and tick control. But definitely, if you ever have questions, I would also contact your vet and find out what they recommend. But this is what our vet recommends, and we've been very happy with it. And one other side of that that I think gets overlooked sometimes would actually be heartworm preventative. Um, heartburn is becoming a bigger issue coming out of the south and southeast where there's a lot of mosquitoes, but there are a lot of cases even up into Kansas now. Um, we use ProHeart 12 and ProHeart 6 depending on the age of the dog and that's a either 6 month or 12 month treatment. But you also need a general dewormer for hunting dogs. Hunting dogs get into dead things and dirt and they're more exposed to the potential of needing a general dewormer. Um, usually once to twice a year, again, depending on your area. And I just wanted to hit on one other thing that goes along hand in hand. When you're looking at these medications that are going to be good for a longer amount of time, weight of the dog. The yep. weight of the dog is what determines the dosage for both the ProHeart and the Brevecto. So young puppies, they aren't always a really good candidate for these because they're growing so quickly. They're gonna outgrow the, they're gonna outgrow the dosage. So, you know, you've got a puppy that's 30 pounds this month. Well, in six months, when your ProHeart shot still is supposed to be effective, they're gonna have grown quite a bit. So definitely it's based on weight. So once your dog is fully grown, um, they're definitely a good time to start these medications. Next question. From Instagram, Airy Fairy gave a scenario. Their dog Pickles decided to go on a moose chase. It was very scary. What? <laughs> Ran out their garage door. Didn't have an e collar on. Is and a wild moose chase. Like a moose. It was ran out. Was chasing moose. They uh, were driving around. She didn't have her e collar on, and they were yelling and whistling for about 20 minutes or longer. Very scared about what? getting their dog back. And. A moose was crossing in front of her, and as soon as she turned around, there was your dog. So she scolded her and told her how mom was so scared about the situation. Um, and the question was, what is the best way to discipline without hindering training? Dogs live in the moment. Pickles had the time of her life chasing moose, romping around in the fresh air, didn't know she was truly doing anything wrong, and then when she does come back, that's not the time to get mad at her, scold her, discipline her because she doesn't know she's doing anything wrong 
by coming to you. So you think about it as your dog just went gallivanting around. Now, if you could have gotten to her, then you bring her home safely, that's great. But when she comes back on her own, if that's when you're like, pickles, you naughty dog, you're never gonna run away from me again, and you get after her and you scold her, she's gonna think that she's a bad dog by from coming to you. And why is she gonna wanna come back the next time she goes on a moose chase? Because these things can happen. Um, so my advice would be just build a really strong recall with collar conditioning during training sessions. And then if this situation would happen again, when she does come back to you, tell her what a good girl she is, praise her, thank her for coming home, and then bring her back into this you know, house where it's warm and comfortable. Um, but don't discipline her for when she actually does come back. Correct. I think that's a pretty common thing that we see fairly regularly. People are like, oh, bad dog, he ran away but they can't actually discipline them until they come back. So now you're, if you think about what you're doing, you're disciplining the dog for coming back to you. So don't do that. The wild moose chase sounds funny now, but I can imagine I can't it very believe scary. how scary it would have been. It says, why do you prefer a GSP to a German wire pointer or a DD? Well, we already kind of said that they're the best dogs in the world. I, I will say that the, the, the beard is a pretty cool thing. But generally, I would say personality temperaments are different, and I prefer that of the short hair. I feel like they have... They're a really good, well-rounded dog with, uh, with a lot of mental stability. They're very affectionate and friendly dogs, great family dogs. Now, these are all generalized statements. There's yes. bad eggs in every carton. Oh, yeah. Mm. Bad yep. apples in every barrel. There's there's good and, do and bad dogs in every breed. I would say that. There's a spectrum in every breed. The good, the great, the bad. And most of the time, the dogs in the, the middle. What are you doing? This is my diagram. And we're, for the most part, um, working with dogs in that general middle end of the spectrum. And I feel like with the dogs that we've worked with, the short hairs are all in that middle end to the upper end of that spectrum. And sometimes we work with other breeds that fall in that middle end to the bottom end um, on a fairly regular basis. And that's just in overall trainability, uh, bitability, cooperation, affection, like we talked about mental stability. So. Well, Kat hijacked that question, so I get another one from Instagram. Um, M Stanley 333 what's the point of roading? Uh, we've gone over this in some of the other videos, but it's not a bad thing to touch on again. Roading is important for a couple different things. One, body condition. Two, pad condition. This is a huge one we get asked about boots and how do you take care of pads and everything else and the answer to that is roading. So roading is a good overall conditioning to the dog and preparing them for the hard conditions that we put them through in hunting season. The key to that is no dog should be roaded until their bone structure is more on the mature side. So you're looking at a minimum, don't be starting roading um, until they're at least 12 months if not 16 months old. So, great question. How much of it is natural ability and how much is Ooh, training? Robert DeCicio on Instagram. Okay. So we always put this generalization, you know, statistics, that sort of thing. 50% are genetics and 50% are training. So, you know, 90% of statistics are made up on the spot. And I would say that that's usually pretty true that there's development involved and genetics involved. But not all dogs that are super natural in the field and come through things naturally are trainable and vice versa. Not all dogs that are super trainable and cooperative are very natural. Um, you want to look for a really nice mix of the two. You have trainability, you have natural ability, and then you have the combinations there. But some dogs are trainable but don't have any natural ability. Some dogs have lots of natural ability and are trainable. And the ultimate goal, the ones that we're looking for, have a lot of natural ability and a lot of trainability, and those are sometimes hard to come by. Yes. Good question. How often do you feed your dog? SD Lynn. Twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, unless we're hunting hard, um, and then we'll give them maybe a few kibble 
to bait their water when we float their food um, because water is an important part of recovery, hydration, super important. And in order to get them to drink when they don't want to, we'll kind of bait it with some food, um, but it's a very minimal amount. And then they get the main part of their meal in the evening after they're done hunting. But on a general day-to-day -day basis, twice a day. Perfect. Instagram says Tony Jenkins 062019. How much water should I pack for a single dog out of state hunt? Three days maximum. It's a 64 pound griff. Okay, so there are a couple facets to this. One of which is going to be the fact that you're wanting to pack water is awesome. Um, a lot of people, I think, pack a little water and then kind of rely on getting water as they go. And I would say that. Um, gut microbiome is pretty drastically affected by the water that the dogs are drinking and that um, changing on them drastically can be means for what most people say oh it's just road stress well that road stress a lot of times is just due to a change in water not so much the actual stress of tra traveling so um, as far as how much I would say a five gallon bucket is going to be a five gallon jug which I use um, they make water specific, but I've always bought diesel, uh, no, kerosene, kerosene excuse me, kerosene blue. jugs because they're blue. Um, and they do a good job holding water. Or our dog box has a aluminum tank. Water tank. Yep. Now, if you're on a short three day hunt like that and you run out, our recommendation would just be go to the gas station, the grocery store, Walmart, and get filtered water. Yep. Um, but if you're on a long, you know, two week hunting trip, you're not going to be able to haul enough water. You're probably not going to want to go buy a bunch of water. Um, but if you can transition them slowly, you know, use half of your five gallon jug and fill it up with your local water. So it's a mix. And then once you've used through that, then they're just on full local water. Um, that's going to be the easiest on their guts for transitioning. Yeah. So when I go up to South Dakota, we have to transition over water because I can't haul enough for a two to three week stay. Um, but they do exactly how Kat said. It's, I use our water until the jugs are about half empty, top them back off, so now we're 50-50. When I use that down to top it off again, now we're 75-25-ish, and then we're 100% switch over water. And that happens over the course of two, three days, and usually it's easier, so good question. Next question, and this question we honestly do get asked quite a bit. Um, it's only been asked on this question thing once though. It's from Steve Songer 79 on Instagram. Do you notice a difference in hunt drive between a neutered and unneutered short hair? Absolutely not. Uh, the biggest thing people make generalizations about, oh, I neutered oh, my I short my, hair or my male. Spayed and neutered and now they're fat lazy. Well, when you think about it, you are neutering your dog, you're changing the testosterone levels, the hormone levels, their metabolism is going to adjust as well. Because they usually, they're getting older around that time. Depending on when you neuter yeah. them. We neuter our males usually seven, eight years old, so they are older, but some people neuter as young as a year or two. Um, and they're still kind of in their prime, but it is still going to adjust their hormones and testosterone, their metabolism is going to adjust and just like as we get older, I can't eat like I did when I was in high school or I gain a lot of weight. Uh, this guy can still do that, so we won't go there. But if you feed your dog more or the same amount and they're getting fat, then they're like, well, I don't have to work as hard. It's harder for me to work because I'm fat. So that's where people get that idea that their drive goes down. They don't hunt as hard. So if you adjust the amount of food that they need to keep them in good body condition, you're not gonna see a change in their drive, their desire, their hunting ability, their energy level. Um, Nick's our male, we neutered him. Um, he is coming on eight and he still hunts so hard and he's in good shape, but we don't have to feed him quite as much as we used to. He used to be a hard, keeper. Um, we would struggle during hunting season to keep weight on him and um, between changing diet a little bit as well as his neutering, he is in really great shape and never lets up, hunts hard all day for us. So, so under exercising and overfeeding makes your dog fat and lazy, not neutering. Yes. Okay. We're, We're at time. like 22 minutes. We probably need to stop now. What? Okay, hey guys, thanks for joining us today on You Ask and We Answered. Um, we Between appreciate two peacocks. Between two peacocks. 
Uh, we appreciate y'all uh, checking in, watching, and subscribing. Thanks, guys, and we will catch you next time.